Sorry about that. Um, but yeah. Uh, so, you know, ever since the COVID era, we have done these meetings virtually, but with the new year, um, we're trying to do things a little bit differently. And so we wanted to um, do this one hybrid and see, you know, will people come in person? And I think, you know, part of the confusion was, I think there definitely will be more people that come later, but part of the confusion was we advertised the the meeting starting at one time and the panel starting at another time. So I think a lot of people might come for the panel that we advertise is starting at 7.30. So uh, if there's a big influx of people at 7.30 or shortly before 7.30, I'm sorry about that. And I think next time we'll just promote just the beginning meeting time. But thank you uh, for those of you who did come for the whole meeting. Um, we've got seven people virtually and it looks like uh, maybe like eight to 10 of us uh, here in person. And so- I would say since so many people, it might be a good idea to like just take a second to have the introduction. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, yeah, we will- do things a little bit differently just because of this new format and so um do you have ideas on what what we should say in our introductions and would you like to lead us off um yeah sure i mean i think just kind of like overview of like your name maybe like where you live in howard county like why you're here um so my name is mary i am i live in columbia i'm kind of new to maryland but um, I am the co-chair of our revolution, Howard County with Jake. Um, and I'm really excited that we're talking about this issue because I feel like honestly, like people can't stop talking about it and that's a good thing. Um, but I am excited to just have some like engagement in our community about Palestine. And, um, yeah, I just think it's so important to come together on issues, especially that are so divisive. Um, so did I answer all my questions? I don't know. Said name. Uh, I live in Columbia. Yeah. That's, that was okay. okay. Cool. Um, do you want to go? Yeah, sure. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jake Burdett. Um, born and raised here in Howard County. I do live here in Elkridge. It's not why we chose this library. It was just the only one that was uh, available. But um, I, uh, you know, I'm the the co chair of the of the organization along with uh, Mary here and. Um, yeah, I'm also excited to be doing a lot on the issue of, you know, Palestinian solidarity, but also, um, as people could see, you know, we're, we're also engaged on a lot of other issues, whether it be rent stabilization, you know, health care is a human right. Uh, there's a whole lot to do, um, even if, you know, uh, the foreign policy is, is not your thing. And so uh, thank you, especially the new people um, that are here and uh, excited to hear uh, about, about the rest of you. So. Um, want to go with you. Yeah. Um, so I'm very interested to learn more um, the subject and I get it because I don't know about the question how we engage in the that has organizations like this. And so uh, happy to learn more about that as well. It's a big issue for tonight. Are you Rob, Robert Holder? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, I saw the, the email address, uh, but again, yeah, cool. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michelle, and I live in Howard County, and I'm from Jamaica. Uh, I'm interested in the issue, and uh, we one here. Hi, uh, I'm Connor. Um, I live in Elkin City, and also relatively new Maryland. But um, here, I've been working on the rent stabilization stuff with 
the Jacob Mary and Jake said, hey, you come over. <laughs> sure I am. Um, I've been doing a book club with a couple of my friends. Uh, we've been reading Tenants about Israel um, and figured it would be cool to hear from some other people that aren't just people that I am. Thanks, Connor. My name's Elisa Nigel Petiz. I've been with our revolution since it became our revolution here at Howard Camp. Paul was running it, and Dave LaRange. And uh, I came here tonight because I want people to hear my point. I'm a Jew, and I resent this organization calling it genocide. And I want to know where that comes from, from your perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, these are definitely, you know, topics that will be touched on with the the panel. And thank you for thank you for coming. Um, My name is uh, Brett Batiste. I'm, I'm a disabled U.S. Marine. And uh, I have a lot of stories about Palestinians uh, and uh, being a person of, of war, I can tell you a little bit about really what goes, goes on regarding uh, regarding what really is happening over there, not being told by the press, but by someone who has been there. You say you're you're a veteran. Yeah. Okay. Well. Well. Thank you. Um, Thank you, everybody, uh, for for coming and for sharing. Um, I'm curious. We could test out the uh, the people on virtually to see if like we do yeah. want to hear them. Yeah, I think my speaker's pretty loud, so I could try it if you want to. Okay, cool. All right. Yeah. yeah. People outside. Remember the hotel that wanted to come early. Oh yeah, yeah. The one, the one late. Okay, yeah. I could I could go grab her while um if if you want to start the introduction. Yeah. Can you mute your sound? Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Can someone try to speak uh, on Zoom and let me know, or we can see if we can hear you from there? Hello, it's Beth. Do you okay. hear me? People hear Beth. Okay. Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Do you, oh do you want to introduce yourself, Beth? Oh, hi. Yes, my name is Beth and I am uh, a new member and nice to be here. So I expect to hear some new things going on today. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else virtually? Um, I know Harry and Kat, so they have to be on mute. I see Yang is here. Virginia. I don't know if someone's in front of the camera there or not. Sarah, if you're there, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Let me turn on my camera. Could you see me? Hello, my name is Sarah, and I am a Howard County High School student. And I am here because I am interested in knowing more about the genocide that's going on in Gaza. And yeah. Thank you. Does anyone else want to introduce themselves from Zoom? Um, we have some new in-person folks coming in. If anyone wants to introduce themselves, we were just going around saying our names, you know, where we live in Howard County, why we're here at this meeting today. Hi, I'm Thank you for coming. Thank you. Would you like to introduce yourselves? Thank you for coming. I'm I'm curious uh, for for those who are new, you know, not typically like a part, you know, come to our revolution stuff like. 
how, how did you hear about the panel? Is it being on our email list or you just saw it on, on social media? Mm -hmm. Okay. Good to know. Uh, so no, no one else uh, on virtual? No, I don't think so. Um, now just maybe switch the yep. sound block. Okay. Hello. Uh, I hope people can hear me there virtually. Um, but uh, yeah, so... Uh, we will now go ahead and get started with the uh, official business now that we got introductions out of the way, um, but just some some general ground rules. And for those who missed it, normally we do these meetings virtual. So we're, uh, you know, trying to switch to in person. So some of these ground rules are more for the virtual participants. But, you know, uh, especially for virtual people, stay on mute if you're not talking, please, um, you know, use the, the raise hand feature or, you know, in person, you just, you have something to say, just, you know, raise your hand. Uh, we don't mind. Um, uh, there will be a Q and a section for the, uh, during the panel discussion. And so, um, if you have something that you want to say to that, just wait till the end. But, you know, if you do have a comment or question at the end, you know, try to keep it to, you know, generally a minute or less, just be conscious, conscious of, uh, everybody's time. Um, cause other people will probably want to say things too. Um, in terms of our steering committee, uh, you've heard from Mary and I, the, the co-chairs, um, we also have several, uh, at large members, um, including, uh, Percy Lee, who's our social committee chair, who, uh, wasn't able to be here tonight. Um, Beth Velazquez Snedden, who is on with us virtually, um, Joan Pontius, who I think is also on with us virtually, um, Sarah Pan, who you just heard from and, uh, Kat and Francis, uh, we who, um, uh, it's, uh, Francis's birthday tomorrow. And so they're celebrating that tonight. And so they're not, uh, or I think they, they might be on virtually, but, um, so, and they gave us this tech equipment. So thank you to them for that. Um, but, uh, one thing that we do have to vote on before, uh, we, you know, move on with the rest of the meeting is that, um, unfortunately our treasurer, Paul Basich, um, recently resigned, um, from the role. And so that means we need a new treasurer. Um, but luckily, uh, uh, steering committee member Francis Wee has uh, agreed to serve as treasurer. And so we just have to take uh, a formal vote to make that official. And so I want to motion that uh, we make Francis Wee our new uh, treasurer. Um, do I have a, a second? For, second. For that? I second you. Okay. Uh, for those at home, Mary just seconded it. And so... Um, all Yay. in favor of appointing Francis as the new treasurer, uh, or I, I, I'm sorry, before we make that motion, hello, before we make that motion, um, is there any discussion? Not on my part. Um, so all in favor of making Francis we the new treasurer for our revolution, Howard County, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Please say nay. Okay. Um, sounds like the motion carries. And so Francis is the new treasurer. Uh, congrats, Francis. And thank you, Francis. Uh, also, uh, we do have a, the secretary role is, is vacant as well. And if uh, anybody is like looking to get more involved with the organization, um, secretary, it's just, uh, not too, too serious of a role, just, um, you know, drafting occasional emails to the list, creating calendar events uh, for uh, the uh, for the different activities that the chapter is doing. And so um, if people want to follow us on social media, become a dues paying voting member, join our email list, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we have all of that and more on our link tree there. And there's a QR code if you want to uh, see all of that. Um, in terms of our uh, treasurer's report, um, last update, uh, Christmas Eve um, from our, uh, again, now now resigned treasurer, uh, Paul, but uh, we're, we're still um, pretty healthy. We've got uh, over $1,600 in the bank. We don't spend money too, too often. Um, and then we also sell Our Revolution and Progressive merch, most of which can be seen in this picture here. So if anybody is interested in buying it, you know, anywhere from like three to ten dollars, so pretty cheap. So if anybody's interested, let us know and we will uh, get you hooked up with that. Um, in terms of 
things that the um, things that the uh, organization does like outside of just the general meetings. Um, you know, I think uh, if you're on our email list, you've probably seen that we've been quite active in rent stabilization efforts, uh, which Mary's going to talk about a little bit later. But uh, outside of just like the individual issues, we also have uh, like standing committees that do things just on a month to month basis. We have an education and issues committee that does um, either standalone presentations and events or part of our monthly meetings on just different topics, whether it be healthcare as a human right, food as a human right. Um, teachers unions, things like that. Um, so we've got a committee for that. County legislation committee um, headed by uh, Joan Pontius, who's on virtually. Um, social event committee, which plans monthly social events. Uh, Columbia Association board watch committee uh, headed by Jim Hubbard, who monitors and reports on what the Columbia Association is doing. Um, door knocking efforts, um, electoral, uh, electoral activities. Um, and so if I encourage people to get involved with any of those if uh, if they're interested. Um, and uh, in terms of the education and issues committee, again, that was a uh, is uh, Paul Basich, our treasurer, who um, was leading that. But and we've done a lot of presentations at um, these monthly meetings and standalone events. But uh, again, he he resigned recently, and so um, we're kind of looking for a new person um, to take that on if anybody is interested and here is like a list of um topics that they had in mind in the coming months you know teachers unions housing and justice renewable energy um things like that and so uh that is one thing that people can get involved in um next uh want to get an update from the county legislative committee um Joan, I think you're on here, right? Or is Joan not on here? I thought she was. Um, I but did not see her. Maybe not. Okay, never mind. Well, um, just a, a small update on county legislation. There was a lot of pretty good. We told the camera that was... Yes. Sorry. There we go. Um, there there we was go. a lot of pretty good uh, county legislation that had been introduced, including the rent stabilization bill that this chapter has been working pretty hard on. There's also um, a, a forest conservation bill, a bill to make uh, you know kids meals at restaurants um, more available. Um, and uh, unfortunately, our county council decided to basically kill all of those bills on um, January 2nd. Uh, they had already all been tabled once and they either needed to vote on them or table them again. And they just voted not to table them again, not to vote on them. And so all those bills, including rent stabilization, um, are going to die on January 16th if nothing is done before then. Um, but uh, there's also some other good bills in the works, some affordable housing bills, um, and we'll see what happens there. Uh, but that's the update there. Um, in terms of the, uh, the social event, um, the social event committee uh, again percy's not here tonight unfortunately but uh, we do do these every month with uh progressive democrats of howard county another local organization hello um and uh the last one we did was in december it was a white elephant gift exchange party um and uh um yeah, uh, you wanna you, you wanna take it. I'm getting a random call just in case it's a chance. Sure. But thank you. Okay. I don't know. Personally, I don't think really need to go into depth about. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you're good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, spam call. Um, but yeah, we're gonna do a uh Patapsk, a hike at Patapsco later this month. We will keep people in the loop on that if they're interested in coming. Um and uh want to uh throw want to throw it over to jim hubbard for um an update uh on the columbia association watch committee okay so that the last yeah, board yeah. meeting the last board meeting the board approved the draft budget <clears throat> as proposed by the staff with only one change uh so what that means after six meetings and four months 
That's the only thing they changed in what the staff proposed. They never discussed $13 million in cap proposed capital spending. They never discussed any of the proposals made by the villages. You can go on the CA board website and in the packet associated with the, the December meeting, there's a long list of proposals made by the villages. None of them were discussed by the board. Uh, the other thing that came up at the meeting was that Terry Hill is, is discussing legislation that would um, organize how tenants are informed of their opportunities to participate in CA programs and would also attempt to have CA fees treated for tax purposes as other similar fees paid to local governments. I frankly don't understand quite the second part. The first part, Gerald Herbert's in later in the meeting made the point that it's not clear what CA's policy about tenants or employees is. And so that needs further uh, research. But in any case, uh, basically the CA is an organization on autopilot that the board has had lots of meetings and simply never discussed most of the budget or voted, and like I said, voted on only one change which was only for $200,000 out of an $80 million budget. So, that's well, it. Well, thank, thank you for that update, Jen. I, oh, yeah, is that Jenny Thomas? Yeah, may I comment on one other thing? Uh, maybe it wasn't the, I think it was the last meeting. Um, Karen Emery, that well, you all know, made a proposal to reduce the annual charge from 68 cents per $100 to 62 cents based on all the surplus CA has had in the last couple of years. Uh, I fully support that, I agree with her. And the other thing is in many areas now you're getting your tax assessment increase. I doubt it's a decrease. So um, what happens is CA doesn't increase the annual charge but they get the benefit of your tax assessment going up if they keep it at 68 cents per hundred dollars. So I totally agree with Karen. It's time to reduce it. Unfortunately, she only got one vote, her vote. Now, Eric, I believe Greenberg would have voted for it, but he was uh, he was uh, in the hospital. Uh, he's fine now. But so I, I think that's an important thing. Uh, things are getting very expensive. So. Uh, I don't know how you feel about that issue, but uh, I think it's important. And we can get you more details. I don't want to take the time now, but if you want. Well, well, th well thank you, uh, both Jim and Jenny, for uh, those updates. Again, you know, for people that live in Columbia, if you're interested in getting more involved and following along with what's happening in the uh, mysterious Columbia Association, uh, Jim's CA watch committee is a good opportunity to do that. Um, but uh, moving on before we get started with our panel discussion in a few minutes and are you, are you Hannah? Okay, cool. Nice to meet you in person, Hannah. Um, but uh, just want to, this might even be a good transition into the Palestine uh, panel because this uh, is there's an update on this related to Palestine. Basically, uh, people might be familiar with the group Moms for Liberty, kind of like a far right extremist uh, group trying to infiltrate, you know, public school curriculum and whatnot. And there is a local Moms for Liberty chapter here in Howard County that's been uh, somewhat active. And there's been a group of people um, you know, group of people on the left trying to like resist it. And Sarah Pan from our organization has been helpful with that. And so Sarah, I don't know if there are any updates. I put in some of the stuff in the slide here. Yeah, honestly, after the event happened where Moms for Liberty's rally about anti-Semitism got um, postponed, there hasn't really been much activity, but basically, Moms for Liberty tried to host an event where they were talking about trying to limit Palestinian support walkouts, but then they reframed their agenda saying that, oh yeah, it's anti-Semitism. And I think members within the coalition 
said that like oh yeah moms for liberty is only like trying to do this just so that they can infiltrate public schools rather than trying to get productive discussion about Israel and Palestine and um regarding divisions within the anti moms for liberty group so i'm sure some people like cat and ying are familiar with this and have seen it but basically i believe ying if i recall correctly talked yeah mentioned that a montgomery county teacher got reinstated for having something related to free palestine in their um email signatures and then and the, but like other teachers in Montgomery County who said supported Israel hasn't gotten the same. Mm -hmm. They're on administrative. Mm -hmm. Yep. So whatever Kat is saying in the ch chat. And then I believe Ying or Kat shared it in Moms for Liberty, the Anti-Moms for Liberty Coalition. And they were pretty much dis. Okay, I am glad to hear that she is being represented by lawyers from CAIR. That is good. But basically, people from the coalition either were just very dismissive and said, we don't want to split the coalition, or they they just tried to, like, they were very pro-Israel, I guess, in their discussions. But yeah, there is division within the anti-moms group for liberty over palestine and i'm not sure where the group is going after this but that ends my recap well thank you sarah for for tracking those efforts and yeah i didn't quite expect moms for liberty to get involved with israel palestine but it's uh certainly an interesting decision for them to do so and i'm glad that they ended up canceling their event probably because of uh the the backlash that it was starting to get and so uh, we will see if, if there are any other updates on that um and just just so people know uh, all of our panelists are here for the discussion but i think they just one or one or two of them needs a couple more minutes and so uh we do have uh one or two things we could talk about in the meantime but we will get started with the the panel yeah in, in if you want to go find out you can just take a there for a sec okay um or i can stabilization you kind of did but i don't know yeah uh if you yeah if if if, if you want to do that uh go for it but i, I could go check with them um if that's what you're yeah, doing yeah. yeah let me mute again my bad got it okay hi everyone um again if uh if you weren't here when i introduced myself my name is mary i am a uh, Co-chair, uh, and I've mostly been working on rent stabilization um, in Howard County. So like Jake mentioned, there was a bill that was introduced in October that was honestly super weak and was not going to provide tenants very much protection from uncontrolled rent increases that are like making it unaffordable to live here. People are being pushed out of their homes, like not able to afford to live here. Um, and uh, it's just been a lot. So uh, we have been working to introduce our own bill. We weren't able to get our own bill introduced. Then once uh, the current bill that's uh, on the table or whatever um, had been introduced, we've been working with co uh, council members to get amendments passed to make the bill stronger. We got an agreement from one of the council members to introduce all of the amendments that we wanted, um, which would just benefit tenants in Howard County much more than the bill as it stood which just had a lot of stuff like it wasn't even permanent. It was like a four year bill. And um, there was just like a high rent cap that wouldn't really make too much of a difference for renters. And um, yeah, so you heard what happened um, with the vote last week. But um, for that reason, I'm going to put this in the chat. Um, I didn't prepare like a QR for the people who are here in person. But here again is the uh, letter campaign that we are circulating right now to um, ask county leaders to uh, basically take immediate action on rent stabilization before it expires um, because it's very important to 
tenants and just people in the Howard County community, like their well-being, health, all these things. So um, if you uh, would please send a letter, we would very much appreciate it. It's super important that we show the county leaders that people care about this issue and that, you know, we're not going to let it go and uh, renters really need the support. So um, that being said, how are we doing? I'm going to, I'm checking the cheek whether, what's the situation? Okay. Um, I think we're just going to take a brief pause. I think all the, what's it called? Panelists are here and um, we're just going to get them set up on this table. We're going to make sure you can hear everyone. And uh, yeah, so just like two minutes, hopefully. Known for its hospitality, its innovation, and I always like to say it's barley for whatever reason that always comes up in the history books. Um, barley was one of the most important products. Um, just a couple of fun facts. It was also um, the birthplace of gauze. The word gauze comes from Gaza um, and many other things. It was home to birthplace of the famous, one of the, the uh, famous Islamic scholars and um, in the four schools of Islamic thought. Um, Imam uh, Shafi'i. I usually have other pictures, beautiful pictures of Gaza that I don't have time to go through, but this is one from my hometown, home city, um, and neighborhood of Rimal in Gaza City in the 1920s. Okay, so we've heard the term Gaza Strip a lot. Um, I get asked a lot, and I and again, I'm trying to address the kinds of tropes and stereotypes and myths, and um, we hear these terms being thrown around, Gaza Strip, mostly refugees, you know, um, right of return, et cetera, et cetera. So what does that mean? I'm going to break it down a little bit. Okay. So the Gaza Strip is actually a mid-century, 20th century construct um, that, that did not exist prior to 1948. When people said Gaza prior to 1948, what they meant by that was um, the Gaza District. Okay. And that was one of many... Um, British mandate districts within historic Palestine that encompassed, as you can see, this much larger area. And even prior to the mandate during the Ottoman area and so on, it was the greater Gaza area. So in fact, historically, when people would say um, in Arabic, Asqalan, the city of Asqalan or Ashkelon, they meant by that Gaza. So it was considered this much broader area. Okay. Now, why this is important is in, in 1948, um, during the, in the wake of the creation of the state of Israel, um, invading Zionist militias um, drove hundreds of thousands of Palestinians from their homes. And in our case, and for the purposes of today, um, those who were in this shaded area were driven from their homes and sought refuge in the closest urban center to them, which was Gaza, thinking, of course, that they were seeking temporary safety and they would be allowed back to their homes, which was not to happen. Um, the Gaza Strip was then carved out in 1948, 1949 in the Egyptian-Israeli armistice agreement with the understanding that these were not permanent borders and these Palestinians would be allowed back. That never happened. And that influx tripled Gaza's population overnight. The Gaza Strip was created. And thus, we have a situation where today we constantly hear the modern day Gaza Strip consists overwhelmingly, 75 to 80 percent of the population, of refugees who do not consider Gaza their home, but rather are from this broader area that we often hear referred to as the Gaza envelope today, Gaza district historically. So that's just by way of context. Um, these Palestinians in Gaza are under the uh, um, umbrella, receive services and go to schools and um, health clinics and so forth administered by the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees or UNRWA. Um, separate topic and discussion. Um, they um, have a separate mandate over the Palestinian refugees um, and are the only group, in fact, um, Palestinian refugees that have their own organization. Um, Palestinian refugee status is inherited, unlike other um, refugee refugees around the world. Anyways, so that's just giving you a little bit of background. Of course, this is what the Gaza Strip then turned into on the right. Um, this is just an illustration of that event I talked about in 1948 which Palestinians refer to as the Nakba, the catastrophe, otherwise known as the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. And this is just showing you the flow of where Palestinians um, um, ended up fleeing to as they were driven from their homes. Those in the north ended up in Lebanon and Syria. 
Um, some ended up in Jordan. Some were internally um, displaced um, into the West Bank, what would become the occupied West Bank and the Gaza Strip, and then were not allowed back, right, um, to what would become Israel. Again, this is just an illustration of where these populations of Palestinian refugees exist today. And when we talk, when we hear about this issue of the right of return of Palestinian refugees, this is what it refers to is allowing those Palestinians to go back to their ancestral homeland. Um, this was also, by the way, how any of you heard of the Great March of Return that happened in Gaza? Um, so that's what it was about. It was it was a um, several years long um, nonviolent weekly protest at the border of northern border of Gaza with Israel to um, demand the right of return of Palestinians um, to their homelands or bring that issue back to light. OK, so just kind of talking a little bit more now about um, the overall <clears throat> themes before I get into Gaza itself, um, because it's easy to just kind of talk about Gaza and not understand what this is about or talk about, as Jake said, the here and now with not understanding what this is about. Gaza is part and parcel of the greater Palestinian struggle for liberation, for freedom and movement. Um, it is not its own entity. It just, we frequently talk about Gaza being a metaphor or um, Gaza being a laboratory um, or the lens through which one can understand the broader Palestinian struggle. Um, just kind of the most glaring example um, of that. And um, I'm trying to see here where I, I have something, but I, I feel like I'm out of order. Anyways, um, the way the maxim that sort of um, defines, informs the way in which um, Israel rules over and the policies Israel uses vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians is um, maximum control over the land um, with as few Palestinians in the land as possible. Um, this is referred to also known as the demographic, Palestinian demographic threat. Um, and that is in order to retain a ethno-religious uh, majority in the land. Um, in the words of sitting Prime Minister, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, the state of Israel is a state for the Jewish people and the Jewish people only. Now, this is despite the 20% um, of the Israeli population that is actually Palestinian and the 50% of the population in the entirety of the land that is Palestinian. Um, now, the way that Israel um, rules over Palestinians is through this um, oppressive system that is otherwise known as apartheid as defined by several international human rights organizations um, through the systematic oppression that um, divides Gaza from the West Bank, divides West Bank towns and villages from one another and divides both of those places from Jerusalem. And it does that, it controls the movement of Palestinians through um, territory specific ID cards. I don't have time to get too much into that today, but it's an ID card system that it began um, distributing in 1967 when it formerly occupied um, Gaza um, and the West Bank. And um, that ID card um, will allow you entry into that territory only, but not into the other territories. And you cannot give it to your spouse. You can add your children, but if th there's a very complicated system where, and if they aren't there physically and you don't add them, they lose that right to their own land. So it's not like I can just be absent for a certain amount of time. Like if your driver's license expires um, um, or your American citizenship um, and and you don't renew it, or you, you don't give it to your kids or you forgot to apply, um, they would suddenly lose their American citizenship, right? So that's is the equivalent of that. And then this is especially the case now in East Jerusalem. Um, if you're a Palestinian East Jerusalemite and um, you come and you study in the U.S., for example, um, for two or three years and you haven't been able to go back to renew your ID card, that's stripped from you and you no longer have um, residency rights in East Jerusalem. You might be able to visit as a foreigner, but you no longer are considered a Palestinian um, citizen, national resident of East Jerusalem. These same laws do not apply to the Jewish Israeli residents of the city, I should add. Um, and if they discover that you also have American citizenship, if you're an East Jerusalem who has, uh, they'll also take your ID card from your Palestinian ID. Different sets of rules apply to different areas. You can read more about it. Um, this is, a lot of these graphics are from the site Visualizing Palestine, which I highly recommend you check out, but I'm just gonna move on because we don't have much time. Um, so again, it's kind of this divide and conquer um, you know, a ghettoizing of Palestinian populations, the largest ghetto being the Gaza Strip. But it's just important to remember that theme of separating Palestinians from one another 
maximizing um, control of the land and um, restricting the, or denying them movement at all in some cases. Oops. Um, just showing you, we're not spending too much time on the West Bank, but I think it is important to highlight that often we see maps where we see Gaza and the West Bank as like continu contiguous blobs. But I just wanted to highlight this really quickly. What does everyone, anyone notice? Just a quick observation about this map. Okay, a lot of um, what are known as, and I apologize if what I'm saying is rudimentary, not every, I don't know everyone's knowledge of it, but a lot of what are known as um, illegal um, settlements or Israeli settler colonies. Um, what else? Okay, very good. So the, the green areas, which are known as area A, Palestinian area A are completely separated from one another by hundreds of um, Israeli checkpoints, um, some of them flying checkpoints, some of them permanent military um, checkpoints and barriers, some of them temporary, some of them not. I share the screen real quick. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Not bad. I thought it was. In addition to the checkpoints that divide those towns from one another, um, as you can see, 60% of the area of the occupied West Bank is known as Area C which is actually um, in full, under full Israeli um, civil control. And Palestinians are barred from developing or building in 99% of that land. So taken in conjunction um, with that Area C, which is now a closed military zone that Israel has effectively annexed, and the um, separation barrier and the military checkpoints, Palestinians have only you know, nominal authority over a fraction of the occupied West Bank which of course is completely separated from Gaza, right? There's Okay, so now we're gonna go back to Gaza for a second. Um, it's the size of the Baltimore metro area with uh, two times the population, um, just by way of reference. And it is the most closed off and surveilled place on earth. Um, and I'm gonna get into a little bit into that later. It's always been subject to some form of closure um, by Israel. But as you can see here, every border, land border, all of the airspace and all of the sea space is completely controlled uh, by Israel. So there's even a buffer zone that extends um, about a mile inland into Gaza, what's called the no-go zone, um, where about one third of Gaza's arable farmland exists. There's, a, there's been a naval blockade on it, so fishermen can only go out about four, um, at worst, maybe eight at best nautical miles into sea. And there was a semi-functional airport at what point that was completely destroyed as well. So it's not an exaggeration to say that Israel controls everything about Gaza from people who enter and leave to what foods are allowed in or out to when you can turn the electricity on to how much water you get. And to illustrate that, um, oops, I have this very short little video. Has anyone seen this before? I don't wanna play it, I always have to ask. Okay, good. A couple of people. I feel really bad for like people who have seen this before because then they're hearing me repeat myself over and over. So this was actually created in 2011, I want to say, maybe even 10, um, after Israel's first attack on Gaza, Operation Cast Sled. And it's it's just amazing to me that how true it still holds. Um, it was created by an Israeli human rights group and Israeli animator. Is it working? So I don't have much time left, so I'll try to whisk through the rest of this. But yeah, well, I want to make sure they have time to... Um, so I talked earlier about how, um, you know, we often hear of Gaza being under blockade or enduring a siege um, since X amount of time, since 2006. But the reality is Gaza has been subject to some form of closure, sanctions or blockade ever since the early 1990s. Um, and I usually give the sort of reference of the visual of sort of a noose getting tighter and tighter around Gaza over the years. Um, by different ways of restrictions, whether it was the um, the banning of the family um, unification permits that were allowed, um, the disengagement, the um, closures happening after that, um, and, and so on. Um, uh, I talked about always when you think about Gaza, thinking of it again, um, thinking about the bigger picture, that this is really not just about Gaza, but it's about a struggle, a, an overall Palestinian struggle for rights um, and freedom from an oppressive system um, and a violent system of um, Israeli apartheid that ghettoizes Palestinians within the West Bank, Gaza being the largest one of that ghettos, um, with the overall policy of um, maximizing Israeli control over the land with a few Palestinians in that land 
as possible, leaving Palestinians with the false choice um, of what I like to call the right to remain silent. Um, Israeli minister Smotrich has put this, as, as termed it, the Smotrich plan, which is Palestinians have three choices. Um, they either, um, they either um, accept a life of subjugation under Israeli rule, um, they, they um, leave, so forced transfer, um, forced or voluntary transfer, or they get killed, so, or we kill them. So this is called the Smotrich plan. You can look it up. They're pushing it now and trying to transfer Palestinians in Gaza into the Sinai in line with this plan. Okay, so Israel's relationship to Gaza has been defined through this tone of repression. Again, this is nothing new. It didn't start on October 7th. It didn't even start, you know, um, in the early 2000s. Um, shortly after the 1948 war, um, very shortly after, um, one Ariel Sharon at the time, before he became the prime minister of Israel, was um, assigned to a kill unit, an Israeli kill unit called Unit 101. And they were tasked with killing Palestinians who had newly become refugees within Gaza who were trying to go back to their um, homes, towns and villages across the border. And um, he massacred dozens of Palestinians in, a, in an infamous massacre um, in the Bridge refugee camp um, in 1954. Um, again, in 1956, you have the Suez crisis, also known as the tripartite aggression. Um, my mother was a survivor of this particular massacre, and I remember growing up with her telling me tales about it. If you want to know more about it, um, I encourage you to read Joe Sacco's graphic novel, Footnotes in Gaza. It's fantastic. Um, 19, in the early 1970s, um, once again, Palestinians, Gaza has always been considered kind of like this hotbed of resistance when it comes to Israeli occupation. Um, the, at that time, interestingly, um, they were known as the Fidei'in, Palestinian resistance fighters, who were actually members of the Marxist um, Palestinian Front for the Liberation of Palestine, the PFLP. So remember, Hamas didn't exist at this point, okay? So again, Ariel Sharon, this, the same characters kind of make this appearances over and over when it comes to Gaza, um, is assigned um, to go into Gaza and pacify the Fidei'in. Um, and so he goes in and he um, orders the bulldozing of large swaths of um, tracts of land with, and homes, thousands of homes within the refugee camps, um, and um, the summary execution of over a thousand Palestinian men, earning him the moniker, the bulldozer. My grandfather was shot. Oh, really? In the subhanAllah, I didn't know that. Um, and so in 1987, you might have heard the word intifada. Um, it was really never a big deal. I don't know why suddenly it's the scary word. <laughs> we grew up with, you know, I grew up in the first, not there, but I mean, visiting regularly during the first Palestinian intifada, also known as the shaking off or the first Palestinian uprising. The birthplace was the Jabalia refugee camp in Gaza that you might hear about in the news right now. So unsurprisingly, you often see that the, um, the birthplace of a lot of Palestinian resistance happens to be in refugee camps, not just in Gaza, but often primarily in Gaza, but also, for example, in Lebanon. Um, and that is for a reason that I talked about earlier, which is, of course, the, um, the, uh, the displacement and the ethnic cleansing of those Palestinian refugees from their homeland. Uh, Gaza was also the, um, the location of, I mean, it was all over Palestine, the second Tefada, but I'm referring specifically to Rafah, in which we might hear about now in the news, bordering Egypt, um, where Ariel Sharon um, was prime minister at this time and um, ordered the demolition of hundreds of homes in Rafah bordering Egypt um, and raised over two thirds of Palestinian homes um, in that area. It was during this period that American activist Rachel Corey was killed trying to protect Palestinian homes in Rafah. So again, just keeping that in mind that the repression of Gaza specifically, Palestinians more broadly is nothing new. Um, we've heard a lot about the these plans, these open Israeli, calls to ethnically cleanse, to displace, to transfer, push Palestinians out of Gaza into Sinai. Um, and this is actually a continuation of a, I want to call it a fantasy, that Israeli leaders had dating back to the early 1970s. I'm talking about Gaza specifically. It was called the Alone Plan. Um, and it was this attempt to what they call thin the population of Gaza, to get rid of as many Palestinians there as possible, um, again, in, in tune with, remember I talked about the demographic threat and reducing the Palestinian population and then annexing um, annexing Gaza. So that was never totally fulfilled, although many thousands of Palestinians were actually um, 
transferred out of Gaza and into um, Sinai during this period. Um, I met a lot of them after the Israeli disengagement in 2005, who for the first time in decades had been reunited with their families. Um, Israeli leaders have often considered Gaza a thorn in their side. Um, even uh, former Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, who was one of the, of course, um, you know, uh, negotiators, uh, leaders during the Oslo Accords, famously said in 1991, he wished he would wake up one day and found that Gaza um, had sunk into sea. Okay, so this kind of brings us up to speed to 2005. Um, and I usually start here, but today I added a bunch of other things. Yes? Were you defined in but inside of Columbia? Intifada? Yeah. Yeah, Sammy, you want to? Yeah, it just linguistically it just means uprising. It's the Arabic word for uprising. Yeah, it literally means like the root word is like shaking off. Um, but it's it's sort of more broadly understood, like figuratively as as uprising. Yeah, literally means shaking off of like the occupation figuratively the uprising. Um, OK, so I usually start in 2005 and this was this was the year that um, Israel. Uh, disengaged, this was the the original name was the Israeli separation, actually. And it was this, this, we often hear in the news, Israel left Gaza in 2005. How many people have heard this phrase? I show of hands. Um, what more do they want, right? We left, we gave them Gaza. So this process was called the disengagement and it was formulated by Ariel Sharon and his advisor at the time, Dov Weisglass. And it was actually um, a strategic sort of um, reformulation of Israel's occupation of Gaza and nothing more. Um, it was a dismantling of the illegal settlements, Israeli settlements within Gaza and the relocating of those settlers elsewhere to the occupied West Bank and the reinforcing of the occupation remotely on Gaza. So instead of having settlers and soldiers within Gaza in what they considered to be in harm's way, um, they started to control Gaza remotely from the outside. They reinforced the wall and the electric fence around Gaza um, with sniper towers and began to monitor Gaza 24 seven with drones and tighten that noose around Gaza. Um, it was nevertheless in the very brief days after the disengagement, these are pictures I took the day after when I was living in Gaza at the time of reporting, um, you know, a, a momentous occasion because for the first time in decades, these Palestinians on the left had access to this beach, this shore, which was formerly for the exclusive use of the Jewish settlers in the Rosh Khatif settlement block. They weren't allowed, Palestinians weren't allowed to use it. Um, on the right, this was a Palestinian photojournalist. I remember seeing him taking pictures of the settlements after they were dismantled and torn down. And he was wearing a vest with images of Palestinian babies and children that had been murdered by Israeli troops. And he said he was doing it as a reminder for anyone just, you know, who was documenting this to remember, to remember them and the sacrifices that were made um, in the years prior. So it, this was a unilateral process, again, that Israel undertook without any, any um, consultation or coordination with their Palestinian Authority counterparts at the time, run by Yasser Arafat and the Fatah movement. Um, in the words of the, the um, architect of the disengagement of Weisglass, this was to be considered nothing more than a sort of strategic political move that intended to freeze the political process and any prospect for so-called peace with the Palestinians. They wanted to ensure there would never be a Palestinian state. And he, in his own words, said, don't understand it as anything else. We are not handing Gaza back. We are not ending our occupation of Gaza. Now, that is sort of the, the context that leads us up to the Palestinian elections in 2006. In the, after the disengagement, what happens is an unprecedented um, closure of the Gaza Strip by Israel that precede the election. So for months on end, Israel unilaterally shuts all of the commercial crossings that it controls. Nothing is allowed in or out of Gaza for months. It completely devastates the economy. People are rightly upset. Farmers lose millions of dollars. Um, at that time, it was the height of strawberry season and, um, and other produce that were ordinarily, um, with coordination, allowed to be exported out to the West Bank and Europe. Um, on the heels of this, the Palestinian elections in 2006 happened, seeing um, the newly formed Hamas's political wing come to power. Uh, this was not anticipated, though their participation was encouraged um, in the, the thinking being that they it would kind of, um, um, you know, bring them into the broader political spectrum. Um, it was the win was not anticipated and it leads to, you know, the U.S. getting involved and the CIA doing what it does best, of course. 
um, meddling and it um, funds an attempted coup. Um, and you can read more about this in Vanity Fair, but they um, they siphon in uh, millions of dollars and hundreds of thousands of arms to an opposing um, uh, strong man known as Mohammed Dahlan to attempt to um, overthrow um, or even preempt. They hadn't really taken power yet. It doesn't work. Um, Hamas counter coups. They take control of Gaza in 2007 and more sanctions and a full-fledged blockade is then slapped on in, in addition to the closure that already existed. Okay, that's kind of leading me up to the end of the presentation. Most of us are familiar with the blockade on Gaza that has existed since that time. I was trying to point out to you that kind of what preceded that um, in terms of the political events that happened and also the closure that was already in place of Gaza. The blockade tightens even further with the stated goals of depriving Gaza um, of um, you know, its basic freedoms of fragmenting the Palestinians further, separating them from their counterparts in the West Bank and Jerusalem. Um, and the stated tenets of the blockade by Israeli officials were no development, no prosperity, but no humanitarian crisis. And what they meant by that was, let us keep Gaza um, on the brink of collapse continuously, letting in only an intravenous drip of relief, um, but never letting it get to the point where you know, it is an all out catastrophe, which of course we are, you know, witnessing today. But this is back in 2008, Israel tells the US, keep Gaza on the brink of collapse, but don't push it over the edge, keep it functioning at the lowest level possible. And that's exactly what happened. And asked about the the, the goals um, of the blockade, Dov Weisglass, again, the guy who was the architect of the disengagement said to Haaretz, the main Israeli newspaper at the time, the idea is to put Palestinians on a diet, but not make them die of hunger. And we see this sort of weaponization of food happening yet again in a more brazen fashion now during the current crisis, but it's nothing new is my point. Um, this has always been used as a tactic um, to be able to control um, Palestinians. Um, what does effectively a blockade on Gaza mean? You're likely to be unemployed, be unable to build, rebuild the home that has been demolished or destroyed because of the ban on the entry of dual use items, what are known as dual use items like cement and so forth. Um, you're unlikely to be able to visit family outside of Gaza. Um, I always remind people that 75% of the population is under the age of 25. Half are under the age of 18. And almost all have never been outside of Gaza. In fact, I was speaking to a friend of mine. Some of you might know him. Um, he's a Palestinian poet called Musab Abu Toha. And he, his son, young son is an American citizen. And on his way trying to get out of Gaza a few weeks ago, um, he was stopped by Israeli soldiers that had set up a checkpoint within Gaza and um, he was abducted and stripped and beaten and tortured. Um, and, and finally, after a lot of pressure from the New Yorker that he wrote for was released without any of his things or passport or belongings. But he later in a conversation told me, Leila, this was the first time in all of my years that I had ever seen an Israeli. And this was my first encounter. Um, so what I'm trying to point out here is the only interaction, the only medium through which pal most Palestinians in Gaza have ever interacted with an Israeli is through the mediums of drones, of bombs, you know, of snipers, um, and sometimes a remote voice, perhaps at a, at a checkpoint, that's it. So that's bringing us to, to the current day. This is, I think, a few days old. Um, the, the numbers, I think, are closer to 30,000 that have been killed right now. Um, I'm not going to dwell too much on the numbers, but they are, they should chalk us all to our core. Um, it is the, the most devastating um, um, war in the words of the UN uh, United Nations Office of Coordination for Humanitarian Affairs representative, in all of her years working in humanitarian um, in the humanitarian sector, she has never seen an aggression um, this devastating in such a short time, such a short scale on a civilian population. Um, and again, this is being funded with our tax dollars. Um, um, going back to my earlier point about the age of children in Gaza, Many of them now um, mark their age with the number of assaults that they have survived. Um, I was asked to touch on media a little bit, so I added these slides quickly. Um, again, I don't have much time to talk about this, but often what we see is the use of the passive voice when it comes to covering Palestinians in the media versus Israelis. So we often, and I every day I face this issue when I'm speaking to editors or I'm trying to help someone work on an op-ed or something. Um, this insistence, this immediate, you know, um, sort of um, questioning of a Palestinian death, first of all, and using the passive voice, so a Palestinian died 
rather than was killed or Israel killed the Palestinian. And if you insist on using that phrase, they'll usually put in there, Palestinians say. So, you know, I had a friend who's, you know, brother was killed and I think the headline said so-and-so's you know brother was killed he says or you know reportedly like it's never a fact that it happened um and of course this has a real impact in in terms of you know the way that Palestinians are viewed um in, in the early 1980s Edward Said published a, a seminal essay called Permission to Narrate that I encourage all of you to read it, this was in regards to Israel's um, slaughter at that time of Palestinians in Lebanon and um, the ability to narrate our own stories in the media. Um, and I've just been thinking a lot about that recently, but he talks about how often the right to narrate war from Israel's perspective and according to Israel's interests, um, you know, is what dominates and not much has changed, unfortunately. Um, usually I tell people who are asking me, what do we do about this to push back? Um, to avoid the passive voice, to own the narrative. Um, it does work when you talk to the media and you insist and you write a letter to the editor, it does work. Um, this is an example of one of my friends who was writing an op-ed about um, the death of his brother and his brother's family. And they kept saying, I think this was the Washington Post, um, they had said, um, instead of Israel killed, might we say an explosion, or he was saying that the editor was saying, and he said, no, they said, can we just say an explosion killed my loved ones rather than Israel killed my loved ones. And he immediately shot back and said, absolutely not. You know, um, there isn't some random explosion that killed them. This was, you know, and so it's just an example of how this works, how you have to understand this, the nuances of this language um, and why words matter um, because this dehumanizing language um, is used often to give Israel this moral pretext to slaughter Palestinians and desensitize the, the population to their slaughter. So it's not a big deal. And this is just an example over the years of different things Israeli leaders have said in regards to Palestinians, not just in Gaza, of course, but more broadly. Um, just another example of the language of genocide um, that Israeli leaders have been using. This was, of course, in the very early days of the war in Gaza. Um, talk about fighting human animals, and later the Israeli prime minister framing this as a struggle between light and dark. Uh, just kind of skip through some of this, but just some more examples of how, you know, uh, words matter and how disinformation is deadly for Palestinians and has a very real impact, not just on Palestinians there. Um, this kind of language, um, again, gives, supposedly gives Israel this moral pretext that it, that it needs um, but, you know, it therefore renders Palestinians less human or subhuman and dispensable or disposable and has a real impact as well on Palestinian and Arab American communities and communities of color in the United States who are by association. And we saw this happen several times during the course of the past three months. By association, considered barbaric and subhuman and somehow responsible, right? Um, these are just some of my family members on my mother's side that were killed um, several weeks ago. And this is my aunt um, in Gaza City, who was who was um, killed in an Israeli bomb bombed um, the house immediately next to her, and it killed her and my um, three adult cousins and my cousin's wife. Um, I'm very moved by this. She was a novelist and poet, and this was the very last thing that she wrote. Of course, there's multiple examples, including my dear friend um, Rifat al Arari, who many of you might know, um, who was killed, um, was told he was going to be killed by Israeli intelligence and then was targeted. His house was targeted. In his words, the most dangerous thing that he held in his hand was an expo marker. So we see the deliberate targeting of Palestinian intellectuals, of Palestinian institutions, of universities, of cultural institutions, of places of worship, um, which is why we talk about this as a genocide and as a war that is intended to make Gaza unlivable. Um, and um, I usually like to end with a little bit of inspiration. People often ask me how Palestinians cope, what they do. Um, I often point, this is to past examples after the last um, war on Gaza of a friend of mine that had a, was an industrial engineer who had a 3D printing workshop and they would print tourniquets and uh, masks for burn victims. Um, by the way, all of their printers were handmade from recycled materials and, and recycled filament because I don't know how many of you know about this, but my son was really into this. So I was really fascinated by this and um, none of these things were allowed into Gaza. So they made them themselves. The workshop was destroyed for the second time. Um, a few weeks ago, I finally got in touch with him and he himself was 
alive but displaced twice and his everything that he owned and knew has been destroyed. Um, so this deliberate targeting of Gaza's, again, it's productive sector. This is an engineer friend of mine who had created this composite um, material, building material to help um, Palestine, Palestinians rebuild their homes um, after the last war in Gaza. And um, and then again, just ending with um, the, the um, you know, people often feel hopeless and um, and completely demoralized. And um, I always end with this picture of this farmer that I met in Gaza who was replanting his farm for the third time. Um, and he did, and he was smiling and, and explaining to me how um, Israeli um, bulldozers had completely destroyed all of his farm for the third time consecutively. And, and remember olive trees take, you know, more than 10 years to become fruitful and productive. And yet here he was insisting and, and saying, this is my way of resisting. Um, and I have no choice but to do this, but to keep going. And so I always remind people if if he can do that and if Palestinians can do that, then we don't have an option at all. And I always tell people when they say, what can we do? Is that no action is too small. Um, think about what you're good at, what your area of strength is, you know, what your community is um, and, and do it. Just, you know, don't be a silence observer. Um, contribute in whatever way you know how. Maybe that's, you know, educate yourselves, educate others. Maybe that's a conversation you have with your neighbor or your community center. Um, maybe it's, it's um, you know, um, just again, posting if you're on social media. Um, maybe it's um, going on a, a trip when when the situation allows for it. Uh, maybe it's it's lobbying, you know, your Congress members. Maybe it's phone banking. I don't want to take too much time up. I guess I took like way more than I was supposed to. Sorry about that. No, so okay. I, <laughs> yeah. I learned a lot that from it. Good. I hope everybody else learned a lot from it. Before we transition to the panel, it looks like we have maybe two. Yeah, and I don't know if you want to do the questions now or later. It's up to you. Um, yeah, if, you, if we keep it quick, we, we do them now real let's quick. Let's cut it off like strictly two minutes. I'll okay. keep the time at 821. We'll just cut it off, start the... Thank you, thank you. Uh, is this a simple yes or no question? Uh, no. I'm just kidding. <laughs> do, you, uh, do you believe or how do you feel about Israel's right to exist? Well, I mean, I and I think most Palestinians say, you know, we have no issue at all, zero. I'm going to even take it a step further um, at all with the Jewish people's right to exist. What we have an issue with is Israel existing as a racist state at the expense of Palestinians, if that makes sense. So Israel existing as an ethno-majority um, state exclusively for the Jewish people without Palestinians being given any rights or freedoms. That's what Palestinians have an issue with. Um, but for time immemorial, Palestinians have had no issue at all, you know, living side by side um, peacefully. Uh, with their Christian and their Jewish neighbors, and this has been the history of the land. And I imagine Sammy is going to be addressing that a lot more. Maybe, maybe I'm just, maybe you're not. Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I'm sure all the panelists would have a good answer to that yeah. question. But by the way, so let's let's hold the questions till till the end. But thank you. Um. But yeah. So. Uh, thank you for that presentation, for giving that very, very important context and history there, Layla. Um, and so um, without any further ado, um, you know, I think uh, people have a good good understanding of your background now. But if we uh, could hear uh, from from our other panelists, you know, a little bit of you know background information about yourself and like what your connection to the issue is. But we, we start with uh, Hannah Percy from uh, Baltimore Jewish Voices for Peace. Hi, y'all. Um, I'm Hannah Persley. I am from Baltimore Jewish Voice for Peace. Um, I am a social worker by profession. I specialize and work with forced migrants. So the Palestinian refugee issue is very personal to me professionally um, and also as a Jewish person and as a human rights advocate. Um, so thank you, Layla, for that amazing um, concise introduction and uh to, to I'm glad you thought it was concise <laughs> and, yeah it could, it's very impressive um and yeah uh, thank you sammy for being here as well and grateful to learn with all of you today could, could you give some background information on jewish voice for peace as an organization that would be helpful um so jewish voice for peace is a national organization we have chapters across the u.s and we are a group of anti-zionist jewish and our allies organizing towards collective liberation and if anyone has questions afterwards, I'm happy to speak. 
the whole thing. So <laughs> no, sorry. No. Okay. Yes, yes. But thank you. Yeah. Sam. Cool. Um, Salam alaikum, everyone. Peace be on to you all. My name is Sami Zaharna. I am a Palestinian American. I am also um, like Leila. I am also from Gaza. My parents are from Gaza. Um, I used to spend my summers there as a child. I currently serve as an imam, a religious leader here in Colombia at the Muslim Family Center. Um, I live in Colombia. I have four children. Um, my oldest is 12 now, 18 years. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, for, for me, obviously, this the connection, my angle here is that this is very personal to me. My family is still there. As with Leila, we've lost many family family members um, that were killed. Some, you know, I've, I feel like the gamut. And I think that one of, one of the things that you speak to people from Gaza, you see like the gamut of incredible, crazy stories as it pertains to what's happening in the war. So I've had um, my cousin, I have family members that were killed. I've had an aunt, my maternal aunt, my paternal uncle, who both died, but they didn't just die randomly. They died because of a lack of medication. One was diabetic. Uh, one had a stroke and there's no hospitals to go to. Um, I had a cousin yesterday that even though they had permission to leave Gaza, she's seven months pregnant. She can only give birth through C-sections. And so through a family member in Ireland, they got her permission, sent to the Egyptian border, but there's a war economy, there's warmongering that's happening now as a result of this. And um, she shows up at the border and you know the, the generals at the border want upwards of $30,000 per person. And, and anyone who's in Gaza knows this, like this is, this is a thing. Um, I have a cousin who just bought a tent for $1,200. And these are tents that were brought in through the Egyptian Red Crescent. Mm -hmm. um, and I have an uncle, listen to this, this is a crazy story. You know, we, we announced, Leila might remember this, we announced that I had an uncle that we heard the news that he was killed in an airstrike. He was in the Shifat hospital, uh, excuse me, Al-Ahli hospital, um, the one that was bombed, if you remember, um, with a claim of mass tunnels. That, of course, is not true, and it was debunked many times over. Um, so he went to a UNRWA, UNRWA school, a United Nations Relief and Works Agency school. That was bombed. He's blind. He went to another school and he was taking shelter there. Then um, we heard the news that he was killed. And so we spread the news on Facebook. We had condolences. And then three days later, he's, we find out he's not killed. And so, so now my mother is older and this is her brother, her only brother. And so, um, you know, this roller coaster of emotions. So we speak to like what happened. So what ends up happening is that his wife was severely injured. And the protocol there is that they take all the dead people and injured people to the nearest hospital where they do a tally. And um, he realized that the only way for him to stay with his wife, who's really his caretaker and who's injured and wants to be with her is to act dead. So he acts dead, they throw him in the truck and um, along with all those that died. And then um, then he gets there and then uh, his, his sister-in-law saw him in the truck with the dead people and he said, okay, he died. And so um, we found out he's not dead. Um, yeah. Um, anyway, so thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And, uh, yeah, important to just having this conversation. Well, well, thank you all uh, for, for those introductions and, and for that background. And um, so, you know, Layla did a very good job of, you know, setting up the context and the history sort of before October 7th. But now, you know, and, and any one of you can can take this on. And you touched on it a little bit in the in the PowerPoint. I understand not wanting to go too into detail because it's incredibly morbid, but, you know, could, you know, maybe somebody, you know, summarize what has happened since October 7th, what has Israel's reaction been? And then in response to that, what is, what has the global reaction been to, you know, Israel's response? Whoever wants to take that. You can talk. This is your field today, though. So. Really? Yeah. You know who I'm referring to you most of this question. So. No, no. Go. I need mean, someone else to talk. I can always add. Like, if you want to. Go for it. Can you just a good time for some questions before we get all of them out of Congress? Um, so, 8.40, we're going to start with audience questions. We're going to have a panel discussion first. And then we'll go ahead. How about you? Questions. You can take so, it. Yeah. What has Israel been doing since October seventh? Yeah, it's a big question. Yeah. Big question. Yeah, yeah. 
you don't have to cover all that you could you could say some then if the other people want to uh, speak on it but yeah i mean the numbers are growing every day almost 30,000 people have been killed. About two thirds of them are women and children. Um, people are starving, D disease is setting in. Um, Israel is talking about forced transfer into Sinai. Um, the Israeli public uh, generally seems to support these actions to the point that there have been raps and songs and famous artists singing um, about murdering Gaza. So it appears that the public sentiment in Israel is supportive of this. Um, Leila, Sami, do you want to add anything? Um, it's hard to... So, so that, that's what Israel has has done. And what is the global response to, to, to that been? Um, I mean, it depends what... Yeah, I mean, it's it's been this sort of systematic... Um, and and deliberate, I'm still referring to the first question, um, destruction of everything in Gaza. Um, and um, and again, th these were the stated goals in the words of the Israeli um, military spokesperson Hagari, the objective is um, destruction, uh, not accuracy. Um, and in, in line with that, we have seen that over 75% um, of the fatalities have been women and children, that the overwhelming majority of residences in Gaza have been destroyed. Um, and, and again, this is what they promised to do. Netanyahu said the objective is to make Gaza unlivable with the um, understanding that things would get so bad that that Palestinians, um, if were the border to become, um, you know, uh, open or porous, would have no choice but to leave, and they would again thin out the population, otherwise known as population transfer to Sinai. Um, and so that's what's been happening: just the targeting not only of civilians but of civilian infrastructure. Firstly and foremost, they hit the the beating heart of all of the Gaza Strip and Gaza City in the Riman neighborhood, and then they went to the institutions and then the universities, <clears throat> um, the water and the sewage, um, the places of worship, um, the farmland, 40% of it has been destroyed, all of the functioning um, wheat mills and bakeries. The Elkridge branch will close in 30 minutes at 9 p.m. Um, if you need to arrange for a ride home, now is the time to do so. And, they, and again, um, Galad started by saying that they would um, in conjunction with this, um, um, ban or prevent or restrict the entry of food and water and fuel and um, electricity. So that's in short what has been happening. Um, and it has been defined um, as a genocide against uh, Gaza and its people. Um, and it's um, more children have been killed in just these three months alone <clears throat> than in um, 12 years of um, U.S. war in Afghanistan. Um, so it's just, it's mind boggling in just, I think the first six weeks as a matter of fact. Um, yeah, but in terms of the global reaction, um, do you mean by like governments or by our government? <laughs> uh, you, you, you can touch on, you can touch on both. Um, because I think our yeah the our response has been a little bit different than the global re reaction. I mean, I think it's it's you know resulted in a global outcry at least on part of people. Um, governments, unsurprisingly, have been much slower to respond, especially our government, who has been complicit in this, who has been providing you know financial, military, and diplomatic cover for the Israeli government, not to mention weapons, um, and. Um, it's unconscionable and um, I want to say unprecedented on this on this scale, on this level. Certainly not unprecedented in terms of the way that the U.S. has been giving unlimited um, funds and weapons to Israel in the past, but never on this scale um, before. And it has resulted in you know global calls for a immediate and permanent ceasefire um, because the stated goals, none of the stated goals, at least as far as Israel is concerned, has been accomplished um 
but other things certainly have the decimation of the, the people in the population and place. And and that is why <clears throat> you and many others, you know, would consider this to be a genocide because that basically is the definition of genocide, right? Right. Well, I mean. The most difficult thing with genocide is intent, is proving intent. And this is what legal, I'm not a legal scholar, but this is what legal scholars will say. That has been proven for us um, through the language and the words of um, Israeli leaders themselves. Yeah. Uh, did, did either of you want to add anything else? Okay. Um, well, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess my, my, another question I have is like, you know, yeah, I, I and I think most international, you know, human rights organizations also agree that what's happening is is a genocide. And so my question is like, why now, but also historically, why has the US been so willing to keep funding this despite how bad it sort of makes us look on the on the global scale? Like what, what is in it, what is in this for the US to keep justifying this stuff? I mean, I, I, so my angle, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm an imam, I'm a religious person. Mm -hmm. So morality and ethics is something I think a lot about. And what I will say, just speaking purely from, this is more philosophy, right? But from a moral philosophical perspective is that there's this idea of utilitarianism, right? This idea that like, it's essentially a doctrine of what is good is what is beneficial. And I think for some reason, the calculus has been that there is some sort of benefit of supporting policies um, that morally, I mean, I would make the argument and many as many others ethically are problematic. Like there's, there is a problem from an eth, like just from a pure ethical perspective. And so the question is on us is like, do we, can we support that, right? Um, but what, what what is the benefit calculus? I don't know. Maybe this is someone else's specialty to speak to. I think law student yes. Uh, law student. Yeah. No, I haven't had that unit yet. Um, but uh, like, is your question why is the Biden administration? Yeah, the like, Biden administration and the administration because you know Biden's foreign policy take isn't exactly a shift from like previous administrations on, on this issue. I mean, I would argue it is actually because he's, but, you know. Uh, uh, how come, how come you, you mentioned the history from 1948 until the present, but how come you decided to elect a terrorist group? She, 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 but she, she mentioned uh, that prior to the election of Hamas, blockades and other forms of oppression were still being imposed on Gaza. So there were bombs locked from that side onto the Jews. The, the goal for, for Hamas is to destroy the state of Israel and Jews. That is their goal. And you talk about genocide. But there's a different thing to which to well, well, I need to tell you one thing that I didn't know. It was a kind of nice presentation except for the things you skipped. You mentioned to my surprise that Gaza was established in 1948. I'm surprised by that because in 1948, there was a partition and the Palestinians and the Arab neighbors chose not to set up a state. Yes. yes. So yes. how can you complain about colonialism and apartheid when you choose not to live side by side? I, I, I also heard a lot about Israel, Israel is thinking it's only for Jewish people. There is a difference between how Gaza Arabs are treated and West Bank Palestinian people are treated and Israeli Arab population is treated. It is 20% of the Israeli population. They go to the best of schools. They are often presented in some of the best professions, such as medical professions, professionals. And signs of October 7. They have dramatically increased the number of Arab Israelis that are supporting the state in the effort that is going on with us. Uh, it is now up to 70%. I'm, I'm sorry, is there a question or is this no, a commentary? I have, I have a question and comments because we, we, we limited it to one minute. And I yeah. think you you've been okay. at so you've been at a, a minute. So and we're not we're actually not at the audience QA part. I have to mention very much that after 2006. There were no further elections, neither in West Bank nor in Gaza. What kind of 
society is that running without any elections in this uh, whole? Uh, so actually, I'm going to read you something. Um, this is from the Israeli Charter of the sitting government, the Likud government. This is this is from the charter of the Likud uh, party, the sitting Israeli government right now. Um, the Jordan River will be the permanent eastern border of the state of Israel. Jerusalem is the eternal, undivided capital. The government will flatly reject Palestinian proposals to divide Jerusalem. The Israeli government flatly rejects the establishment of a Palestinian Arab state. But so for all the talk we hear about Hamas oh, no. rejecting hold, Israel, hold on. hang on, I'm stop, talking. Stop, stop. Yeah. We, we, yes, we're, we're, there, there, there will be an audience. There will be an audience input section. We haven't got there, so I, I, I have another question before we get to the audience section. And maybe we need to have like a talking stick because. Yeah. I understand that we're adults, but also we're having trouble giving each other the chance to speak. Yeah. So we'll wait for one person to finish speaking. If yeah. we do have a you know a timer to make sure everyone can speak, then we'll take turns responding to each other. Um, I just want to say something here um, before we actually... I didn't come here to get in an argument with Zionists. It is incredibly difficult and painful for us to sit here and use energy and compartmentalize, compartmentalize for a second to come and teach you all about what is happening, about the genociding of our people. My aunt and my cousins were killed. I'm sorry, sir, sir, sir just sir, one second. Sir, sir, I'm sorry. Please, please don't interrupt. Please don't interrupt, sir. All right. I do not condone violence in any fashion or form, but please be respectful of our time and our presence here. We are speaking as our family members are being actively genocided with all of our tax dollars. When they send me pictures of unexploded bombs that say made in Pennsylvania, made in the United States, thank you very much, and signed by our government officials, let's just let that sink in for a moment. When more children are being killed than any other conflict in recent history. You didn't, you, we didn't invite you to interrupt you back. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, okay, so. Thank you, Lisa. Bye. Bye, Lisa. Bye. Bye. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I would just like to remind us we are all adults yeah. and we are in a library. There are like a few children yes. here. Yeah. I sorry. understand there's a lot of emotions going on. If, my, questions, if I can, I would love for you guys to have us. If any of these questions are about the process of us being able to converse back and forth, that's what we're going to ask. ask get from you right now. If not, we're going to have the panelists continue what they were saying. Then we can have audience questions about the subject matter. So if these are questions about how it's going to work, absolutely. If not, we will wait. Um, you Go ahead. I have just want to clarify one issue that someone brought it up here. Is it about the subject matter or is it about... Subject. Okay, we're going to wait on that. So if you can pull yeah, that in. I think all these okay. questions are subject matter. Okay, right? if anything so, is about how we're sharing turns, that's what we're asking right now. Otherwise, we're going to have the panelists continue saying what they were going to say, and then we'll have audience questions. Okay. Um, so subject matter, keep it in your brain. Love to hear it. Want to hear it. Amazing. Um, just we're going to come back to you. Yes, okay. Thank you. Anyone else have a question about how this is going to operate? I think we think we're good on this. Okay. I, I just want to say that we, as people who are trying to learn, then not to take personal every comment, please, because we also are here, we're acknowledging that there are adults, kids, mothers, fathers, that we we are human beings, bottom line, and we're trying to understand each other and to just show empathy. Uh, that's what I want us to just have. It's, it's not an easy conversation, and when people take so personal, it's just not room for discussion and being open and to just just more, you know, open-minded. Thank you. And for any Zionist Jewish folks um, that are still in the room, thank you for being here to to still learn with us. And I challenge you to hold space for both our pain and the great pain that Palestinians are facing right now. There's room for both. Yes. So, well, so please, you. I challenge. Thank you for we'll, that. I we'll, get, that. We'll, get, we'll get back to it. We'll get back to it. We'll get back to it, though. This is still, yeah. This is still, this is still this part. So, I, I have a question before we go. Before we go to audience questions, because this this man's had his hand up for a long time. We're gonna get to it in a second, but I have one last question. Um, sort of based on like what what you know just happened here. You know, uh, you know, especially from from Hannah, although you know, Sammy or 
Layla want to touch on it as well. But like, um, you know, let let's say somebody's question was, no, I don't think that there should be, you know, the 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 a, a Jewish state or you know a Muslim state or a Christian state for that matter. Um, you know, is that is that an inherently anti-Semitic thing? Is criticism of the state of Israel or anti-Zionism, is that the same as anti-Semitism or are they two completely, you know, different? So I see how people easily could conflate the two. Lots of Jewish people live in Israel. They call it a Jewish state. The Star of David is on the flag. You know, it, it seems like a really easy conflation to make. But in fact, there are so many other powers, um, ill-intentioned powers that be involved in Israel the largest organization that donates to Israel um, are evangelical Christians, mm -hmm. and they uh, donate lots of money to Israel because they are intent on triggering the rapture, whereby all Jews gather in the Holy Land, um, the end times begin in which most Jews either perish or convert to Christianity. Um, we also have Germany that donates millions of dollars to Israel to wipe its hands of the Holocaust. But donating money to the Israeli military certainly isn't helping Jewish communities around the world. Um, and there are ample um, Jewish and Israeli anti-Zionists around the world. There are Israelis in Israel advocate, advocating against the atrocities going on against the Palestinian people today. Um, so, no, I don't think that being anti-Israel is the same as being anti-Semitic. It is a state. It is a military um, that is committing genocide. It is antithetical to any Jew who, who claims to live by the Torah. Um, yeah. Well, well, thank you, Hannah. Um, and, uh, as, as promised, um, do want to give, you know, people in the audience an opportunity to, you know, ask whatever, you know, questions yeah. they may have. And so you've, you've had your hand up, you've been patient. Short, a short time. I booked time, everyone. Just yes. So we can all have a seat. Also, gonna do this because we're having trouble. Thank you, Matt. Um, if you do not have this, just don't chime in. I know you want to. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, go ahead. You don't have to be to it. Just this is Keep it to a minute, but yes. Talking about uh, terrorism. They say okay, have your attention, please. The Alfred Branch will close in 15 minutes at 9 p.m. All copiers and the computers will automatically shut down five minutes before closing. So please be sure you have saved your work. The DIY Center and the exit near the DIY Center will also close five minutes before the hour. Thank you. Thank you. How have been uh, called as a terrorist? Who defined this terrorism? Who has it? America and Western Europe have defined as terrorism. The Mandela and uh, the people in South Africa who were standing for their rights were called terrorists. Mandela, after he was president, he was still considered a terrorist until at the time of Bush, uh, and they, they changed his, his label from terrorism to someone who's a president of the country. So this, this issue, who defines them as terrorists? They are not terrorists. They're uh, fighting for the for their land, occupied land since 1967. The United Nations has had so many resolutions. General Assembly had resolutions condemning Israel and saying that it must give back those uh, occupied territories, and they refuse to give them back. So, you know, this is the issue, and they say that they're terrorists. Right. Yeah. No. Point point taken is a very easily weaponizable term, and one person's freedom fighter is not supposed to go off. So after the, the the genocide that's happening and the destruction of all your homes and your family's homes, there these rules are still in place. So there's no reconstruction that's going to happen after that, is what I'm hearing, <clears throat> essentially. So that you can't bring in building materials, you can't bring in anything to rebuild your home. So everything that they're destroying now is to ensure that you can't stay there. So in the, in the immediate, in the here and now, there's no building materials being allowed in and nothing Ordinarily, what happens, because this isn't the first assault, it's just the biggest and most sort of atrocious, um, 
building materials that are allowed in are very, you know, minimal, a trickle. And so it's sort of an excruciatingly slow process to rebuild. Um, you know, you saw the slide I had of the, the um, kind of inventive ways Palestinians were using to, to rebuild. So it's not that they don't eventually rebuild, but it just takes forever. And it's, you know, it's of course, the scale that we're talking about now is very different than the scale that we were talking about before. So even if Israel is now saying, oh, okay, soon we're ending this phase of the war and we'll allow Palestinians back to the North, like to what, you know? So Most of the speak up to get them materials that you need to rebuild. Yeah, a lot of people have been trying to go back. Many of them have been shot on their way back, but um, often they'll just sit in the rubble of their homes just to be able to stake their claim and say, this area, this is my land, and I'm just going to stay here until I can rebuild it. Or they'll just put tents up or something like that. Uh, I'd just like to clarify that one question came out that, you know, why uh, I think the Lynch left, uh, why they do deal with the terrorist organization. Uh, if you look at that history, that when Sonia Visarized was the Secretary of State, she's the one advocated that, that Gaza, that election should go on, and Hamas was part of the election process. It was totally endorsed by Bush administration that Hamas election was going on. And then if you look at some 2016, when WikiLeaks was coming up, Julian Assad that leaked that WikiLeaks, it was coming that the US was advocating that Hamas be elected so that they can divide and conquer with Mahmoud Abbas. Let's leave that and that WikiLeaks was pretty much open. So it was kind of like they wanted Hamas to be the leader. Then later on, they can recognize and they can divide Mahmoud Abbas with our countries. Thank you, ma'am. Do, do you want to find comment on? Yeah. Oh, yes. So I think it's Edward Said. I know Leila mentioned Edward Said. He, you know, he was a member of the PLO at some point, which was a designated terrorist organization. Except for some reason, we made exceptions for American members of it. <laughs> That's true. I never thought about I mean, that. Actually. It makes no sense, but I, <laughs> I think it proves the point. But anyway, he was he was um, he was a professor at Columbia, some of you may know, um, the late Edward Said, and he was once at um, in some sort of debate, and they started it all. And the other guy was just you can find this on YouTube. The other guy was just screaming at him. I don't negotiate with terrorists. I speak out against the PLO. Speak out against the PLO. It's mm -hmm. you know very similar to Hamas type of language, right? And and he said something that really like resonates with me and i think we should you know it to me is always a response to well hamas is doing this and it's very simple right what he says he said listen i will never as a person of peace i will never condone i will never encourage right i will never condone the killing of innocent civilians no, ma no matter where they are as a person as a muslim that's against my faith like same response but he said, but I will never seize the right of an oppressed occupied people to resist, right? And I will never place a spotlight on the person that's stuck in their basement and is trying to get out, right? So all this nonsense about Hamas, 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 Leila, I think very clearly demonstrated that this issue existed before Hamas. I encourage you all to read Khadi's book, Rashid Khadi's 100 Year War on Palestine, mm -hmm. right? That shows that this is a continuation of continued oppression, ethnic cleansing, and killing. Whether you like the words or not, I really don't care. But this is the reality of what's happening today. And if you want to turn a blind eye to it, so be it. Anyway. Thank you. <laughs> it's just a nice yeah. uh, I know there's no batteries in it. Just, okay, here we are. just for show. Yeah. <laughs> it's oh my god. Oh. Um, oh. I was going to say that I'm doing research on suicide prevention as on something. It's if the mic doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, sorry, there's no batteries. Just for show. Go closer. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Of course. Hello, please be a part of Um, I wanted to come in and just offer a little bit of perspective. We're all in our headspace right now, not in our heart space. 
Um, I do suicide prevention research on the grad student at Hopkins. And I just want us to put something in perspective. Violence, structural violence only works in one direction. Okay, it only works in one direction. It doesn't work back and forth. And you can see that result in how people kill themselves. Who's killing themselves as a result of what they're going through? Those are deaths that don't make the news. That's a, that's a perspective that doesn't make the news. And Dr. Rasas El Adid, the one that really mentioned, you know, once the Expo marker and his famous last poem, he even suggested to himself, like, what are we supposed to do? Commit mass suicide? And when the indigenous people in this country were being colonized, the Arawak Indians used cassava root to poison themselves in mass because of colonization. And that is a very striking parallel to what's going on in Palestine right now. And so I just wanted to offer that perspective from a heart space because we should be thinking about those people and, and praying for all of them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But you see, my hold on, hold on, hold on. We got other people. We got other people. We got other people. No, no, talking sex, talking sex, talking sex. She met her answer to the question. She met a guy answer to the question. I'm not trying to get it. You know, why are you up for it? What? Um, yeah, but she never answered the question. Come on, let's just tell her to answer the question. Uh, one of the slides uh, seems to encourage visiting Palestine, traveling to the states. Uh, obviously, it's occupied territory. So, you know, to what extent is it ethical or moral for non Palestinians or for those who have a family in that area? To go there since you know it's, it's unavoidable. Well, it's 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 I'll answer this one. I think I think you're 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 touching on the fatwa that that doesn't allow it. So let's 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 touch base after this. Yeah. I was, I, was, I, was, I mean, I was asking for an honest language, just like a human human mm -hmm. respect. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I I actively yeah. encourage, I actively encourage everyone who is able to go and see for themselves. And now the way through which you do that is matters. So I would usually encourage people to go through the land crossings, for example, um, through Jordan and, and through the, the Jordanian Israeli border crossings. That's the way that I recommend, not through the airport. Um, go through, you know, if you're staying, stay in the occupied territories um, or in um, East Jerusalem, for example, um, uh, support, you know, Palestinian establishments. But see for yourself and don't just you know go as a cushy tourist. That's when it becomes problematic. And I, I guess the same applies anywhere that you travel, right? But go with the intention of wanting to learn and understand. Um, and I mean, I just say that's I always tell people, go and visit, see for yourselves. Your mind will be um, boggled literally um, by what you see. It doesn't really take much. And there's a lot of really you know great programs that facilitate this. So Thank you. You're yes. We do have to start cleaning up. Um, okay. The library closes at nine. Uh, you're welcome to, you know, kind of make your way out. You can speak to each other, obviously. Yes. Um, feel free to continue to talk about this important topic. Thank you, everyone, thank so much for coming. Thank you to our panelists who should not have to do this, but thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you for sharing your time. Thank, thank you all for coming. Please continue to stay involved. It's going to be a big fight to put the pressure on our legislators that we need to take action. We're going to need a lot of organized people. So thank you all for coming. So and we'll just.